Good morning, Mr. Clunes. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, I represent uh, the plaintiffs in this action. You can rule on the issue of damages by simply accepting the majority position in Haverty. Um, now, why do I say that? Because Hoffer, <clears throat> Judge Liakos and Hoffer in 85 said there were constitutional U.S. constitutional and state constitutional violations uh, by not giving a hearing as to the requirements of the regulation. Um, no effort has been made in any way to try to um, do away with that order. It's still in effect uh, at this point. Of course, time and time again for the last 20 years, the Department of Corrections has used various pretexts to try to get around it. But the fact is that there is a constitutional violation there. The um, majority found it. Now, they did say we're not reaching the constitutional issue, but by that I assume they meant Sandin. Um, I don't think you have to reach Sandin. Of course, if you do reach Sandin on this case, um, there's a very strong argument um, if you reach Sandin, that um, the restrictions in this case go way beyond those in Sandin in terms of the significant hardships. In this case, people were put segregated in this east wing, um, not for disciplinary purposes. They were put in this wing with an open-ended um, commitment that could have lasted the full terms um, of their um, sentence. Mr. Rollins, I have a question about the class action part of the, the case, and I'm, I just, I'm afraid I don't understand. What is the point of a class action under Rule 23 if the plaintiffs aren't bound by it? I, I, it seems to me, what are, I don't understand what the whole point of it. I understand that our rule is different from the federal rule and the plaintiffs are not permitted to opt out. So what is the purpose of class action, of a class action, if, if other, others of the plaintiffs in the, others of the class are not bound by it? Well, that's, that's the whole point, that the others um, aren't well, they bound are, by it. They are, they are bound by the declaratory judgment aspect of it, aren't they? But in the uh, federal court, they aren't. And the, the reasoning in the federal court makes a lot more sense. Um, <laughs> The, well, the, class back, the class members are still bound by the decision in the case, right? They just, your point is they can just seek other remedies, additional remedies, if they hadn't been sought in the Well, class they action. can opt out. Well, they, um, in, the in the federal, federal court, court, here they can't opt That's what I'm out. About. In the state court, they can't opt out. Oh, but in answer to Justice Cowan's question, they are bound by the declaratory judgment aspect of the case, correct? They are not, and yes. the issue is, can they then bring individual claims for damages? That is an individual, individualized inquiry in most cases, correct? That's right. But, of course, this isn't a class action at this point. No, no. I, I yeah. full well understand that, but there's been a prior class action, which the other side claims is, is, is mm. race judicata. Mm. But not with yeah. respect to damages. That's the question. But the, the lower court decision is very strong on this point, as is Judge Woodlock's in the federal court. Uh, I think that there's not much question on this issue, um, that it's not fair at all um, to bind these individuals. Well, put it, put it differently, whether or not it's fair, it would essentially do away with class actions where there was any attempt to obtain monetary damages. I'm not only talking about government officials because individual damages are so, I mean, it may also have been put to rest by Aspinall. Individual calculations of damages are quintessentially what class actions are not about in most cases. But in this case, it wouldn't be a problem in the sense that everyone went under the same deprivations. 
Um, I'm so if it was remanded down and the issue of class action was taken up, there could be rules uh, set down as to um, how the damages were allotted. No, there, there are cases where damages can be litigated in a class action lawsuit. But the fact that there has been a class action with respect to certain relief doesn't necessarily foreclose class action with respect to other forms of relief. Uh, yes. Now, getting back to, and I will rest on the arguments uh, in the briefs. I think they're very strong and overwhelming that it's simply um, not fair to these individuals and they cannot be bound by um, the fact that um, the decision was made not to um, go for damages at the time for injunctive relief. Um, so let's get now to um, the dissent position because the main argument of the lower court is that because there was a four to three um, division on the court, you can't, uh, the uh, defendants have a qualified immunity defense. Well, there are a lot of problems with, with that issue. Um, it's based basically on um, the general um, population uh, argument. Uh, that's an argument that was only brought up in the Haverty case. It was never brought up before. All of a sudden, it rises up at that point. And we have to go back to the time of the initial um, impl implementation of the East Wing. That's when the decision had to be made as to whether they were violating the law. Not way further on when the Haverty decision came down. Uh, on the issue of general population, common sense tells us, with all due respect to the minority, um, that general population means no segregation. That's always been the idea. Everyone's talked about it in those terms. Even the Department of Corrections, as pointed out by Justice Marshall in the majority, in the affidavit she refers to at 16, well, maybe it's not 16. In uh, So you're saying if it's a, a prison in which... 10% of the prisoners are held in the minimum area and 90% in a super max area. The general population is the 10% and not the 90%. Um, yes. It has nothing to do with numbers. According to that logic, um, if the majority was um, not the east wing but the other wing, then the east wing um, would not be general population. It would be an it, argument. It, it might be an argument, right. yeah. And, but and, if it's a super max prison... Everybody's in isolated. There are supermax prisons around. Would you say then there's no general population because everybody would be in segregation? No, you, I, you can't say that. Right. I mean, because general population is referred to in every prison, regardless of. Um, and what this is, prison what is, it, and this prison is a maximum security prison. At, uh, the, yes. at the time, it was, I think, the only maximum security prison. Back yeah. in 19, early 1990s. Analysis. But I don't see why that makes any difference at all. Everyone's always referred to general population as uh, an individual prison where there's no segregation of those in general population. Now, I admit, let's say everyone in the prison had the same deprivations as those in the East Wing. Then you'd have a good argument that, that that's general population, everyone's general population. But, but we don't have that situation. Um, and it's interesting to note that in um, the footnote of Duval, um, he talks about 734 of 858 are in general population. So they're conceding um, that, that there is such a thing as a general population uh, distinguished from other um, members of the prison community. Um, and as I, I pointed out... Uh, well, when this was set up, when this facility, when Walpole or MCI Cedar Junction was reorganized in early, the early 1990s because of the rise in gang violence throughout the prison system, it was set up such that two-thirds, as I remember, two-thirds of the population of that prison would be held in the East Wing which had greater security requirements, greater security provisions, right? 
Well, I'm not sure about that. I thought they looked at those individuals that should have been put in there for security reasons, et cetera. Not necessarily the two-thirds would be put in. But I, I don't see where that um, goes to the uh, issue in this case. Well, it wasn't just security. I mean, the, the, the East Wing had DSU-like conditions, solitary confinement. Um, it, it, you, you could only go outdoors an hour a day, things like that. It, it was more than than just a security issue. There, there, were, there, were, there was a level of conditions that was the same as the DSU um, that, that made it uh, that gave it a punitive character. That, I thought that was the issue that was involved in Haverty. Could I hear that again? I, I don't think I could repeat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Proceed. Sorry, let, me, let, me, let me try. Excuse me? I'm not going to repeat what Justice Spina said, but it strikes me that, that what the Collections Department has to show here is the following for qualified immunity, leaving aside race judicata, for qualified immunity, did the officials, the collection officials, have adequate knowledge that placing people in confinement similar to the conditions of the old DSU without complying with the regulations of the DSU would violate the constitutional rights of the people being placed. And what Justice Spina has just alluded to is, in essence, I think both the majority and the dissent uh, at footnote 8 essentially say that the conditions of a co confinement in the former DSU and in the, the East Wing are nearly identical as was adequately supported in the record. I'm quoting there from the dissent. So the question is, did the collections officials know that even if they were selecting a larger group of people to go into DSU-type conditions, were they on, did they have knowledge that if they did that without the due process requirements that are set out in the uh, HOFA regulations, um, or you know, so that they would know that they were violating the constitutional rights, correct? Well, certainly, and your opinion, the majority opinion, lays that out very well, that there were pretexts all along. A rose is a rose is a rose. But uh, the... Well, let's go back to that. If, in fact, the prison system had determined that that entire facility ought to have those conditions, then there's no argument, is there? No, exactly. Right. There's no so, argument, because that would, would be one uh, population to be general, but that's not the case. Certain individuals are being treated differently, and, and that's key. Now, on the four to three issue, if I could briefly um, get into that, um, what are we saying, that if there's ever a dissent, that means the law's unclear? Um, if that's true, then you'd have qualified immunity defense in every case where there's a dissent. There's lots of times that people uh, or judges dissent. And you look at the Supreme Court case um, of Hope, where there were seven uh, district courts that came out um, with a qualified immunity defense. And then the Supreme Court said, no, you know, the law is clear on that. It's always been clear over the vigorous dissent of one justice who didn't even think there'd be a constitutional violation. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's hard to see where that four to three issue, particularly where had this that case, had this case, had that issue been litigated before it got to this court? In fact, it had been litigated in the Superior Court, had it not? The issue in this case? In Haverty. Oh, yes. And you don't have to necessarily remand on the Sandin issue. He, he aired out the Sandin issue. No, but I mean, inmates had indeed challenged their housing in the East Wing. I'm thinking back now. I'm not positive of this. Um, before the case got to this court, and separate and apart from the Haverty case that got to this court, had challenged that in other Superior Court proceedings, had they not? Right, yes. And those Superior Court judges, I don't know whether it was unanimous, but a number of them said, no, there was nothing wrong with the housing arrangements that the department had made at Cedar Junction in the East Wing. Interesting enough, they refer to Gilchrist. That's an appeals court decision that basically um, was the same as this case. And they said there would be a constitutional violation, there would be damages, 
if on remand they found that the two systems were the same, which both parties agree on here. Um, so Gilchrist is a fabulous case. It's an East Wing case uh, that lays out the logic that I'm asking uh, this court to accept. The other case is Dahl. Dahl has one footnote on the issue. It's unpublished. It's a 128. It has no precedential value. So I, I can't see how you can look to some superior court um, decision and say that. Uh, so we're questioning the, whether the whole is the reasonableness of uh, whether a person in the, the commissioner, whoever in that position, uh, would reasonably believe that, that they were not operating in an unconstitutional way. And no, for if the courts had said the, that this was appropriate, how could they somehow? For, for the same reasons why they wouldn't accept the, the dissent here. They, they had no right to dissent. Um, the general population issue popped up for the first time. Um, so I, I don't see where those cases would change the analysis um, in any way. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Daniel. Good morning. Julie Daniel for the Department of Correction, and with me is Counsel Wendy Weber. Um, Chief Justice Marshall and Justice Cordy, you both hit the nail right on the head when you stated that the issue here is whether or not the department acted reasonably and whether or not it was clearly established that they could not house inmates as they did in the east wing of MCI Cedar Junction that arose out of that, the exact same facts that arose out of the Haverty case. The well, issue of a- What do you mean the exact same facts out of the Haverty case? Isn't it the exact same, or comfortable conditions to the DSU? That you have to go back to Hoffa, don't you? Hoffa said you, you can't segregate out certain people uh, and place them in these kinds of conditions because, as Justice Bina alluded to, and I'm really summarizing lots of cases, there's a punitive nature to it. It's not, there's a, and so you, you start from that proposition. Now, if the department chooses to select a much larger percentage of people and place them in, and I'm going to use segregated conditions, meaning segregated like DSU, of which the East was uncontested, at least that's what the record in Haverty said, was the department on notice that if it did that with two people or 10 people or 20 percent or 40 percent, that those people should have some kind of um, hearing, notice and an opportunity to be heard before being placed in it. So it's, it's not Haverty, it's, it's uh, Hoffa and uh, Gilchrist and Martino and all those other cases. Isn't that the case? Well, the factual allegations here are, arose out of Haverty and the changes made at MCI Cedar Junction um, in the wake of 1995 and all of the changes because of violence that were being made then. Hoffer set forth the requirement that under 103 CMR 421, if an inmate were to be placed in non-disciplinary segregation. Apart from the general population, he or she must be afforded the process in the within the regulation. With Haverty, that um, process and that regulation was severely expanded to say, if you are taking two-thirds, Justice Cordy was correct in saying two-thirds of the population was being housed in severely restrictive conditions that this court in Haverty, I'll call it Haverty 1, said was substantially similar to the old DSU and ordered injunctive relief. The department must comply with those regulations. The inmates now, same inmates who were part of that class, are seeking monetary damages for the time they spent in that East Wing. Right, because the issue is, <clears throat> was the department on notice, as I said, that if it, if it treated Two, I think there were two people left in DSU. Yes. If it moved people into segregation in conditions similar to the DSU, which my memory is was not with well, a record established in Haverty that those were similar conditions in the East Wing, whether they were to be afforded notice and an opportunity to be heard, similar to or kin to or the same as uh, had been negotiated in the Haverty case. 
I mean, in the, in the Hoffa case. Correct. For the purposes of non-disciplinary segregation of a small portion of the population, Re Hoffa and the... Uh, I, I understand the department's argument, and, and yes. viewed the other way, you can say it doesn't matter what the purposes are, because the issue is treatment of people in a particular way, no matter what the purpose is. Nobody questioned the security issues at risk in Haverty, I don't think. Correct. Correct. And so the department's position is it's only if you move people from one kind of condition to another kind of condition for non-disciplinary reasons, I mean for disciplinary reasons, correct, that you are subject for non-disciplinary reasons? No, for a non-disciplinary segregation, and I'm not saying that this is what the department is now no, I understand. subject to. Uh, it was reasonable for the officials at Cedar Junction in changing the operations in 1995 to believe that what they were doing was constitutional. Well, why was it reasonable? You had, there was the Longval, the Martino, the, the Gilchrist case that, that all said you, you, you can't do that kind of thing. You can't, you know, a rose is a rose is a rose. And whenever you segregate portions of the population into disciplinary-like conditions, you're violating that regulation. Um, with the Gilchrist case, it, the lower court decided in the department's favor the appeal sent it back to be considered whether or not it was substantially similar and to be tied, the, it was then joined with the Haverty case. So the department cannot be expected to, to have um, followed a law developed from that case because it became part of the Haverty case that was actively litigated. But with you, regards but, so you knew that at the time that, that, that this, this, Haver this Haverty case was litigated. The, the law was stated, it seems to me, in, 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 in that whole series of cases, that you cannot segregate people for non-disciplinary purposes and put them in DSU-like conditions without giving them the, 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 the procedural due pro without giving them the hearing requirements <coughs> and notice requirements that are afforded under the regulation. You, you just can't do that. Every single case that came down dealt with either the actual DSU and people who were physically placed in what the department had termed the DSU or, as in Mr. Longval's case, um, in the administrative segregation unit in Concord. They were all segregation units that had separated a very few inmates from general population for non-disciplinary reasons. Within Haverty... And, and, and each case stated that as a matter of... They, they sent it back for, for more factual findings, but the law was you cannot segregate them for non-disciplinary reasons and put them in DSU-like conditions without giving them a hearing? Apart from general population, yes. However, numerous judges in the lower court and three judges on this court in very strong language found that the actions of the department in making a general population that was very restrictive um, was absolutely constitutional and did not violate the 421 policy. Um, and what are you talking about? What, what, what cases did, was that said? In the Haverty case, the dissent specifically states... The, the dissent? In the, but but that, the, the dissent occurred at the same time the Haverty decision was sent down. What decisions are you relying... What appellate decisions are you relying on that occurred before the Haverty decision was handed down? The issue never went to the appeals court because but Haverty was a class... But it did. It depends how you, the department is taking a view, and I understand it, the department is taking a view that says, unless we are taking a very small number of people, DSU, uh, ASU, um, in Concord, and taking them out of the population and moving them for non-disciplinary reasons into segregation, Nothing applies. Nothing about Hoffa or Gilchrist or Martino or Royce, none of that applies. And it's the plaintiff's position that you're looking at through the wrong prism, and you just have to see if you can go with me. What they are saying, and I'm quoting here from Gilchrist, is whether any placement, any placement, okay, any placement, of an inmate 
in conditions that are substantially similar to the DSU, no matter what the explanation. If you do that without notice and an opportunity to be heard, you are violating the constitutional right. And every case, up until every appellate case up until then, said that, and that's what Haverty said. The difference here is you're looking at whether or not a reasonable official mm -hmm. in the department official's position right. would believe that what they were doing violated those rights. This court didn't even agree that there was a constitutional violation, which would have to, we've, as you did in Torres, skipped over that, um, that part of the, the standard to reach the issue of whether or not a reasonable official in the department's position would believe that their actions in creating an entire general population at a prison um, would violate the 421 policy. And as Justice Cordy stated, if the entire facility had been operated as the well, East Wing. I, I, wonder, I don't understand why Mr. Rones conceded that, and I'm not going to get into that argument because we don't have that case. In other words, I, it may well be, it may well be that if there is a maximum security prison, it may be, and I don't know this, and every single person is in, placed in conditions that are similar to um, the DSU conditions. It may be that the sentencing judge taking that into account knows that to be the case. I, I don't know about that case. I don't have that case. I have part of the population going into um, confinement, which is admittedly or concededly similar to the DSU. And that's exactly <coughs> the point that if you, the department would be reasonable in believing they could do the entire population, they should similarly be, well, it I should be we we, Nobody has said they would be reasonable. You're, you're just saying they would be. In operating. Well, surely the department could have turned the prison into a true supermax prison, of which there are many examples throughout the country. Right? Absolutely. Well, you then may have, as Mr. Loans said, a different constitutional claim, which some people think comes under Sandin, and other people believe comes under the Massachusetts Constitution, which has slightly <coughs> different takes on this. That issue wasn't reached in Haverty, and that case is not before, so I don't find it very helpful to, to speculate as to that. Correct, but in, in evaluating whether or not the actions of the prison officials were reasonable in taking two-thirds of the prison and putting them in those strict security um, conditions, you need to look at whether or not if they had they termed it general population. They weren't trying to um, do an end run around the DSU regulations. They were trying to manage a prison system and an entire maximum security prison where there was only one maximum security prison at the time and divide it into two different populations, sure. one being the, the strict security area being far more secure and far nu more numerous in inmate population. Ms. Daniel, let me ask you this. Assuming that was correct at the time this was done, by the time the appeals court handed down Gilchrist, which seems to me to be remarkably clear on this issue, um, in the language of Gilchrist itself, because by then the, the prison officials had already implemented, I think, the East Wing conditions, correct? Yes. Why would that not have placed the because prison author officials on notice? Because they're still dealing with DSU? Because in Gilchrist, both parties agreed that um, the issue of the, the big issue there was the constitutional issue, not the issue of whether or not the 421 was being followed. And the issue, the, both parties agreed that in light of Sandin and Sandin coming down, the issue had to be returned. I understand that, but, the, for the, but there's guidance. There's guidance for prison officials. They read Gilchrist, and, and Gilchrist seems to me to make it remarkably clear that that what was established finally in, in Haverty, in fact, was foreshadowed massively 
by Gilchrist, if not by Longval and Martino. In other words, you can't do this. You can't take some people and put them in these conditions without notice and an opportunity to be heard. In Gilchrist, the factual issues of whether or not this was the majority of the prison mm -hmm. was never addressed. The, uh, I, the it, issue it that... Se it seems to me that, the, and, and maybe this is, this is what the department's position is, it seems to me that the department in essence is asking us to conclude that the dissent in Haverty is the law. No, absolutely not, Your Honor. What we're saying is that based on the strong language in the dissent and based on other justices in the Superior Court agreeing that the actions that the defendants took were appropriate. How do you then deal with the jurisprudence that there have been dissents all over the place when there has been, when there has been, there have been claims of qualified immunity and the courts have said even though there were dissents, there is no qualified immunity because uh, a dissent in and of itself doesn't indicate because we're not specifically looking at the point of a dissent. We're looking at the strong language of the dissent. And we're looking at the fact that there are other lower court isn't decisions. The, isn't the answer, afterwards. though, that it afterwards. It's not a prior decision that somebody's seeking to ignore because there was a dissent. It's that at the time, before the case was decided, reasonable minds could differ. Absolutely. Well, that, that's, that's the, the case. That the, the law wasn't clearly established because if seven people on the highest court in the state could disagree, how can one say that the law is clearly established? Isn't that your exactly? Position? But, but that, I have a but question. That's been, a, that, I, just I, if I can follow that, that's that that is not that has not been the case in numerous federal cases where there has where there's been a claim that the law wasn't established. Look, there were all of these dissents, and the courts have said no. The law was established, notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. The dissents. I think that each of those federal cases needs to be looked at individually because yes. the language of the dissents in many of them is, first and foremost, not does not carry the strength of the dissent in this oh, case. Oh, I would say that hope carries pretty strong language. Um, in hope, it wasn't simply the fact that there was a dissent either. The um, the Alabama Department of Corrections had been told by its by the DOJ, U.S. D Department of Justice and by its own Attorney General's office, you cannot use this procedure, and they still did it. So in this case, nobody told the prison officials, you can't do this. Okay. I have a question on the class action yes. aspect. Um, why should the plaintiffs be bound by a decision in which they were, could not get out of, because they're not allowed to opt out under our rule, and in which they may not agree with the strategic decisions as to damages. Why should the plaintiffs be bound by it? Because it was the lower court judge's responsibility to ensure that, that every inmate within the class was properly represented, and they were adequate. They were represented by very able counsel that deals specifically with um, prison population cases. And in the request for class certification, their counsel specifically stated, this is a good, re good case to certify because we are not seeking monetary so damages. So are you saying that these plaintiffs were adequately represented by counsel in the class action suit who agreed to yield on any claim as to damages? Absolutely. It was a tactical decision to, um, the, the important issue here was making sure that the inmates within the facility had their constitutional but rights what protected. If those not lawyers, what if those plaintiffs and their lawyers didn't want to be bound by the decision as to damages? What could they do? They could have come in and argued to the judge at any time, and it would have been the lower court judge's responsibility under the strict how would predicates they, of how would they know? How would they know? You don't, you, you're not given notice of a pending lawsuit? Um, the I mean, issue I'm, I'm comparing it to the federal rule, where you are given notice and you have a chance to opt out. Even though no notice is necessary under the Massachusetts rule. Every inmate at Cedar Junction was... But, but there are some inmates who had left the prison. And... How would they know? But in, in any case, you may say that, but there's, I don't believe there's anything. I'm not, I'm not questioning your representation to the court because you happen to have a confined population, but what we determine with respect to whether or not you can give, bring a claim for damages mm -hmm. obviously goes way outside any closed institution, correct? Yes, and this, the lower court and this court has to rely upon the lower court, 
both the judges and the, the attorneys to protect the rights of the entire class. And just because an inmate may have been released, he may come back into the custody and he'll still be subject to the same injunctive relief and still be entitled to that relief in the could, same. Could you, help, could you help me in this respect? If we, if we rule that if there's any claim made in a class action lawsuit, declaratory judgment being the classic, it forecloses any other relief, specifically individual damages. Haven't we, in essence, done away with damages, class actions in a wide variety of cases? Because how you calculate damages will often be determined by individual circumstances. Absolutely not. For example, in this particular case. No, no, I'm not talking about this particular case because Mr. Lowen suggested that you could set minimum thresholds for every day you get, you know, umpity ump dollars, assuming that you don't prevail on res judicata and qualified immunity. But exactly, and it could be very done very similarly. But there are other cases where there are again, we set the rule for lots of cases where you might need individually determined damages. That case would be significantly different in the sense that there would be a personal injury action that would arise out of the facts. Mm -hmm. Well, there, you, there was a federal case involving the, the Massachusetts prison system, Maisonoff versus Dubois in 2004, where the judge, there was a class action yes. involving the prison, and the judge, the federal court judge, didn't even want to decertify the class for purposes of, of, of uh, monetary damages, only considered the systemic issues involving equitable and, and, uh, and declaratory relief. And, and wouldn't hear the, and, and didn't want to hear the individual damages claims. In Massanoff, <coughs> the, the judge separated the two, yeah. but still maintained the case as a class action with monetary damages. It just so happens that at this juncture, there are very few inmates left in the case that are that now have money damages claims. But but, but, but the monetary did, damages claims in that case would have proceeded on an individual basis. I take it. It was still part of the original class action that was filed. Your, your point being that the that counsel representing the class waived those claims. You could have brought damage claims and then asked for a um, separation. Absolutely. Okay. The tactical decision to not seek monetary damages. Well, that now would be a real incentive it. for somebody uh, who was a likely target of a of, of a class action to try to race to the courthouse door and file a class action just seeking equitable and and. and uh, uh, hiring somebody to, 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 to get just equitable and declaratory relief. You could wipe out a, a damages claim by hiring, by seeing that, that somebody got the right attorney. As the defendant, I would think that would be unethical well, on my part. I certainly would. Well, that's the role of the judge deciding whether or not the class <clears throat> is adequately represented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not a process that's just done. You know, with no In concern. any event, Absolutely. if you win on qualified immunity, we don't have to worry about this other issue, correct? That is correct. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Daniel. Thank you. <clears throat>